Greetings, students. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and record my whole PowerPoint for uh, for Congress for you to scroll through to check out at your discretion. Um, well, I've been looking at uh, how Congress operates, the purpose of it, that kind of thing. And so, as a little joke for you here to start out, if a pro is the opposite of a con, then what is the opposite of progress? Well, we're going to talk about it. Congress. Um, these first several slides I'm going to go through pretty quickly. Um, we've already covered a lot of this already in class at the point that I usually go over Congress. Um, so you will need to know the House and the Senate, how they're broken up, um, that the House is based on population. Uh, we'll come to how that's determined in a moment. We've already looked at what the meaning of bicameral is. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I won't really drill you too much on this. And in part, is it's in the Constitution. Um, we will compare it a little bit to what it means to be in the Senate in a second. Um, you do have to live in a state you represent. You do have to be a citizen. You do have to reach a certain age. Uh, the Constitution requires that of anyone. Um, there are no term limits. Um, when we compare this to the state level, uh, some states have limits and some don't. Um, here in North Carolina, there are no limits. Uh, the only limit in the U.S. Constitution for a congressman is that they are limited to two-year terms, and they may serve as many as they can get elected to. Uh, sometimes there's debates about should there be term limitations. Uh, some think we should. Some think it may improve it on government. Um, for the purpose of this particular video, I'm not going to get into the pros and cons of that. Uh, we have fixed the number at 435. The Constitution uh, actually sets the terms of the original Congress. If you go skim over Article 1 very closely, you can actually find the original numbers of congressmen um, in the first Congress. And then it said that that number shall be reportioned uh, every 10 years. Uh, more on that in a moment. Somewhere around the uh, turn of the 20th century, however, there was a determination that we shouldn't do it that way. Um, it was getting too crowded. Um, so we fixed the number at 435. And we just divide out 435 by however many um, people are in the country and then determine there how many representatives every state gets. Um, uh, it's gerrymandering, I talk about this more in political parties, but um, just to briefly cover gerrymandering here, it is a means of drawing up districts in such a way as to kind of pick the winner before there's actually an election. Um, and so I've got games on this. I've got all sorts of things I can go into on it. Um, the census is, uh, as I record this, there are TV ads encouraging you to fill out the census. You are, by law, required to fill it out. Um, and it is prescribed in the U.S. Constitution to be every 10 years to reassess how many people are in our country, uh, primarily for the purpose of determining representation in government. Uh, but it's been um, it also determines how much federal money goes to varieties of programs in states. Um, you are all constituents, whether you want to be or not. Just to cover that um, last term that's on the slide here. Um, the Senate, just to compare it, if you scroll back in the PowerPoint and look at the U.S. House, you may notice you have to be a little bit older. You have to be a little bit more experienced. Um, the purpose is the Senate is the upper house of Congress. It is meant to, uh, it has a longer term that we'll see in a moment. It's, um, yeah, you see, longer terms. Again, unlimited terms. It's intended to be more formal. It deals with more foreign affairs. It does more of checking the president. Um, it, it's intended to be more formal, more upper house, that you were supposed to be more experienced and knowledgeable in the ways of life before you could actually serve in the Senate. Um, so, and that's reflected in the age and the citizenship requirements um, of the Senate. It's also a little bit more exclusive, right? There's only two per state. So it's uh, a little bit more exclusive. Um, we don't divide up the state in any way to determine how each one gets elected. The entire state votes for each uh, senator. Um, if you go check the 17th Amendment, if you remember U.S. history, uh, the progressive era of this, that um, there was actually a movement at one time to get rid of the Senate. And what we ended up doing instead was passing an amendment to the Constitution to say that senators represent a state as a whole. Um, there are some benefits to this. I think I need to go back and revise the salary. I think that's 194000 now. I should have checked that before I started doing this, though. Um, so it does pay reasonably well. Um, one vocab term that shows up in the standards quite a bit is this franking privilege. 
Um, it usually throws anybody. It's not a term you'll remember in a year from now, uh, but it is the ability to use the mail without a stamp. Um, uh, and congressmen will basically use up a few hundred thousand dollars worth of um, worth of government money every year just mailing things to their constituents. Um, usually you can drop it in a trash can as well as anybody else can. Um, this could be just to respond to a letter you wrote them. It could be for them to send you updates. Hey, here's what we're doing for you in Congress. Um, we do need to talk about a limited immunity from the law, though. Um, it is in the Constitution. It is only while Congress is in session and while they are in action, like just to give you a general scenario of what could happen, let's say the police decide to throw a congressman in jail right before an important vote. Um, it does protect them from arrest for minor crimes, misdemeanors, even lower level felonies. However, it's not necessarily setting them above the law. That's only in effect when Congress is in session. And the idea is that your own body is actually responsible for holding you uh, responsible uh, and, and accountable. So if you look at these last two vocab terms, um, they could vote to uh, have you face censure. Um, they could also that, that could just actually be for your behavior on the, the Senate or House floor as well. If you royally screw up, they can actually vote um, expulsion is the name. Basically, if you look at a root word, it kind of looks like expel. Um, it would permanently kick you out of uh, Congress, and it has been done on a few occasions. Um, I can post these videos later. Um, when I'm doing this in class, I actually show videos and examples of this, and I can go back and post these for you later. Um, Congress essentially has a few jobs. A um, couple of them are pretty obvious. Obviously, they're supposed to make laws. That's what the Constitution says they're supposed to do. Um, they're supposed to be like your liaisons between you and the government. Um, if you're having trouble getting your Social Security check, you contact your congressman. Um, the one we need to really know from this, though, is pork. Um, there's a video assignment I may give you later on this that you uh, may want to pay attention to that term, pork. Pork is very important. Um, pork is uh, anything extra on a bill trying to get votes for that. Uh, for instance, let's say you're trying to pass a bill... Um, to give aid to corporations, to people, uh, for coronavirus, to try to stop um, an economic recession from coronavirus. Uh, maybe a couple of congressmen think it's a good idea, and they think it's going to pass, but they decide, well, we want to put a provision in here allocating some money to do something to try to prevent global warming. Um, does that have anything to do with trying to give aid to people? Um, they could then try to slip some money in for something else. Um, there's some notable examples of some crazy stuff if you go Google the term pork and you can find like the top 10 dumb pork projects that have been in the world. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars even could be wasted through pork. Um, so it's, uh, it can also go by the term rider. Um, but it's generally speaking, like I said, it's just a wasteful money, uh, unconnected to whatever the main idea of the law is. Um, sessions. Every two years, we go through a different congressional session. Congress can call, uh, can be called into a special session by the U.S. president, um, and in that event, um, it's going to be a national emergency. Say, uh, December 7th, 1941, we're attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. FDR calls Congress into session to request a declaration of war. It's, uh, it's going to be very rare. Let's say Congress was not in session, and a major a viral pandemic broke out in the nation, and we need to try to get Congress in session to try to pass some laws about this. Um, if they were not already in session, the president could call them into session for that purpose. I uh, will not show this video now either, um, but it's a video of just talking about what the job is like. Um, scroll forward past this. Uh, powers of government we've talked about a lot. Um, remember, Congress can do certain things. They're denied certain powers. Um, there's expressed powers. Remember, Article 1, Section 8 lists them off. Um, some easy examples given here. They can go by any of these terms. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over this right now, though. We've done this before. Um, implied powers. We've also talked a lot about this before. Um, Health care could be an example as well to add to that. So I'll just leave this up for just a second. But we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, Health care was certainly a big one 10 years ago. Uh, powers to investigate. This could be numerous things. It could be impeachment. Um, it could just be simply to investigate any action at all. Um, I certainly can show you several clips. The Colbert clip is actually an investigation into um, 
into immigration in America and, uh, and exploitation of illegal immigrants by their employers. It could just be, uh, for example, as I record this, we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is actually appointing a committee just to oversee Trump's um, executive over, or his use of funds for coronavirus, um, just to make sure he's not wasting it. Uh, and I'll, I've got a video here, too, that I'll just show you and talk about in a moment. Um, I want to talk about impeachment, though. Um, as I record this in 2020, it's a major topic. Uh, considering Trump was impeached a few months ago, um, as this moment, coronavirus is the the major thing in the news. Everybody's forgotten that a few months ago the president was impeached. Um, it has been done to three separate presidents. There have only been four impeachment inquiries in United States history on the U.S. president. Um, there was one opened up against Nixon, although the articles never passed. He resigned before they could have. Um, there was Andrew Johnson, there was Bill Clinton, there was Donald Trump. There is one thing that oftentimes we forget, though. Impeachment can also cover a judge. Uh, and so I have this picture of a billboard here. This is around Birmingham, Alabama in the 1950s. This is right after the, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And we have actually impeached and removed from office judges. Now, there is something else important to know about impeachment. Impeachment does not mean that the official is removed from office. Impeachment means that a majority of the United States House of Representatives has accused a person of misconduct. It does not mean they are removed from office. It means they have been accused of misconduct. That is a very clear distinction. Um, we have impeached three presidents. No president has ever been removed from office by Congress. Um, Unless you're trying to say Nixon, but Nixon officially resigned. He was not removed by Congress. We have actually impeached, if you go on Wikipedia and look this up, we have impeached, I want to say, like 30-some-odd federal judges over uh, American history, and several of those have actually been removed from office by the Senate in a two-thirds vote. Um, in the event that there is an impeachment, it is the Senate, the upper house, remember, that will ultimately determine by two-thirds vote if a person is removed or not. Um, they have to approve all treaties that the president may make with any foreign country. Um, notable example, uh, Woodrow Wilson and the 14 points. Uh, if you go back to American history, America had to negotiate a separate peace treaty. Woodrow Wilson negotiated the 14 points into the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. When he came back home, the Senate would not approve. Uh, the point here is, remember, in America, very rarely does any part of government get to do anything unchecked. The president cannot be a dictator. The president cannot say, here's a treaty that I have signed on behalf of America. Someone has to check that. Um, approving his appointments. Um, that could be his cabinet. That could be uh, he appoints every federal judge, not just the Supreme Court. Um, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of judges, honestly, in this country. Um, there's 90 some odd U.S. district courts. There are uh, 12 or 13 Circuit Court of Appeals, and there's a Supreme Court. Every judge on every one of those courts is appointed by the United States President. And the Senate has to approve every one of them. Uh, if you want to go AP Gov, there's a lot more involved in that, but that's all you need to know for you uh, for civics class. Um, other limits, remember that they can pass laws and the president can sign them or the president could veto them. Um, they could also have their acts declared unconstitutional by the courts. Um, and clicked the wrong spot. And most of these things I've already talked about. Um, I'll talk about these videos, but I've got my phone on airplane mode. I can't show them to you now. I'll just post some links to them later. This one is actually pretty hilarious. D. Snyder of Twisted Sister. Um, Congress investigated, for example, the music industry, and they were trying to claim that his music had meaning that it didn't. Um, the particular song they were actually calling into account there was Under the Blade. Um, and so this is actually just an abbreviated version of D. Snyder testifying before Congress. And uh, he actually essentially tells Al Gore, a senator, went on to be vice president, you may know him from Global Warming, um, but Al Gore was on the Senate committee, and he basically tells the guy his wife's got a dirty mind. Um, but I'll post that elsewhere for you. Um, um, Colbert on immigrants, this one I personally find pretty uh, humorous too. 
Usually you come in, you're supposed to be very serious. They thought Colbert would be very serious discussing his time working with um, immigrants on a farm. He was not serious. He was actually his TV character from that time. Uh, there's also one of Mr. Rogers testifying for five minutes concerning um, federal money for PBS, just advocating that the federal government should keep that funding up. And I want to say that was around 1970. Uh, this was recent, uh, within about a year of the, when I post or when I recorded this in uh, April of 2020. Um, John Stewart testified before a congressional committee concerning a federal bill to give, um, I'm not sure how many millions of dollars it was, but aid to those who were first responders on 9-11 for medical issues they were having, PTSD, those kind of things. Um, Congress was stalling the bill, and John Stewart actually um, addressed Congress concerning this. And a few days later, that bill actually did pass. Uh, baseball, another thing they investigated. Back in the 90s, early 2000s, there was actually a uh, major issue in, in baseball with steroids. And it got to the point that Congress was actually asked to investigate this issue. Um, so I'll post that video as well if you're interested in watching. Um, rules, there's uh, basically, if you ever saw uh, Robert's Rules of Order, I, I usually show videos in class to show what this looks like. Uh, for instance... It's more orderly. There is a person who is addressed as um, the chair in the House. They are the chair of the Senate. And the Senate, you call whoever is conducting the Senate the president. So you, if you ever watched Senate, you may hear somebody called Mr. President, and all they're referring to is whoever is actually conducting the chamber at that time. It's intended to be the vice president, but he's never there. So it's just whatever senator is actually running Congress or running Senate at that time. Um, the rules can change from debate to debate. The House normally has time limits, two to five minutes or so, uh, how long you're allowed to speak. In the Senate, it's generally a lot more open. Could go on for hours. Um, I'll post these as well. You can see, like, what they look like. Um, the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, um, they, they pride themselves on being uh, the greatest democratic lawmaking body in the world. They like to act like it. You know, you're, you're part of the greatest lawmaking body in the world. Act like it. Um Parliaments are not necessarily like that, so there's some videos out there if you just Google, like, Parliament Fight, for instance. You can actually find, like, literal fist fights in parliaments. Um, generally speaking, in the U.S. House, you don't see that. Um, another video of that uh, sort of thing. There are some roles that you need to know. These are, un um, the, the Constitution says that there will be official roles that are assigned, leadership roles in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate and other officers deemed necessary. These are them. There is a majority and a minority leader. Um, so if the Republicans have a majority in the Senate, they choose a member among themselves, and that person is the majority leader of the House or the Senate. Uh, same thing with the minority party. Um, the party whip is actually, that's an old term. They haven't used that term since 1960. Uh, however, if you ever go look at state standards, they still use the term party whip. If you go read... Um, even the newest of civics textbooks published in America, they still call this role the party whip. If you ever see this on C-SPAN, they still call this character the party whip, but he is officially the assistant to the majority or the minority leader. Um, they were originally supposed to like help keep the party in line on voting. Um, these are all, by the way, these next few, are in the U.S. Constitution. Um, the House shall appoint among its members a speaker who conducts the House of Representatives, um, currently Nancy Pelosi, as I record this. And this is just a character that when there's a major issue going on, you'll see them in the news, and it may be handy to realize who they are, although it will usually tell you who they are in the news as well every time they talk about them. Um, for the Senate, officially the leader is the vice president. That character is never there unless they are expecting uh, a tie. Uh, the, the Senate Section 3, Clause 4 of the U.S. Constitution, uh, Article 1, lays this out. The vice president shall conduct the Senate. Usually only does so on like the first day of the Senate, and then he goes home. Um, he is also there, um, if you go back to those party whip roles and the majority and minority leaders, if there is an expectation that there is going to be a tie on something in the Senate, that is the only incident where the vice president is allowed to vote, and they will um, make sure the vice president is there to break that tie. If he is not there, uh, traditionally the president pro tempore is the senior ranking member, in terms of how long they've been in Congress, of the majority party. But they don't have to be. That's just who they traditionally give it to.
and that person is supposed to run the Senate. However, that person also usually doesn't run to the Senate. They usually sign a paper and give somebody else that ability. Um, staff support. Won't talk too much about this. You may have seen Library of Congress, some notable books. Harry Potter, Hunger Games, movies, Star Wars. They're all in the Library of Congress. Um, it's been open to the public for a couple of generations now. It used to be like a private study for congressmen, though. Um, you wouldn't see too much testing on that. Uh, you do need to know committees. Committees are where all the boredom of Congress traditionally happen. And they are um, where, uh, if you go watch the video on like what it's like to actually be a congressman, um, this is where your committee assignment is like your number one job if you're a congressman. Um, this is where bills go to be revised. This is the, the committees ultimately decide of a couple of thousand bills that get proposed, which ones are actually going to make it to the House floor, which one's going to be one of the roughly on average 150 to pass in a two-year cycle. Uh, committees ultimately decide that. Uh, the main one you need to know is standing committees. They're permanent. Um, something that's going to be a permanent issue for a long time. Um, you know, we're pretty much always going to have environmental issues, military, veterans issues, education issues. We're always going to have that. Select committees. Uh, there was a 9-11 commission. Uh, if, you, if you're into conspiracy theories, you, can, you may find some on JFK and the Warren Commission, which was conducted by the U.S. House. Select committee for that. Um, joint committee is pretty rare. Um, it's usually just to like, work out the kinks of a bill, which is an issue we'll get into later. Um, Compose these as well. Um, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren going after Betsy DeVos. If you're really into congressional investigations... You can go watch 11 or 12 hours of investigating Benghazi. Um, you can go watch six, seven days of them questioning uh, Brett Kavanaugh, which eight, nine, ten hours a day. Um, you can go watch all of it. Um, any major issue, Iran-Contra, if anybody really wants to go look into that, you can go watch days and days of investigation and uh, testimony on that issue. Um the way you get on a committee is primarily based on your seniority or if you're a notable household name. Um, if you're from a notorious district, you may get a better committee assignment. Generally speaking, it's based on your seniority. Um, I'm going to skip over this. These are some stories I tell in class. Um, if you want to know them, you can message me in your mind or something like that, and I'll tell you the stories. Um, so we're going to get into the last of this PowerPoint finally. How a bill becomes a law. Now you can go find a Schoolhouse Rock video if you'd like. Um, and so some of this I'll go over kind of quick. So basically, remember, it's got to be an idea from somebody. And it's also important, the Constitution requires that every bill, before it can become a law, has to pass both houses of Congress in the same form. Uh, very, very important detail. Um, I usually show a video in class, um, Obama's deal, concerning health care. And it was very important that the same bill had to go through the House and the Senate. Um, and right now, as I record this in 2020, the Republicans control the Senate, the Democrats control the U.S. House. Um, so, and trying to get both of these out of the House and the Senate to pass a bill can be a pain in the butt. But the Constitution requires that it has to be the same bill, down to every article, every word. It all has to be the same. Um, so that can be a major league of pain, but that's the way the rule works. Um, there's only 535 people who can propose a law to Congress. The president can recommend them. He cannot actually make Congress do anything. Um, the only people who are allowed to introduce a law to Congress are congressmen. They are to be written in proper form and introduced, and they are assigned a number. You can go on government websites and look these up. Um, I could even send you a link to one if you're really interested in digging into this. And the first thing they're going to do is just defer it to a committee, where it will 90-95% of the time die. Um, that bill will be assigned. It could even be assigned to more committees. It could be assigned to subcommittees. Uh, the committee will do one of three things. Rarely, they will revise it, discuss it, decide it's important, and they will send it to, um, to Congress to be voted on. They could actually vote to kill the bill. They're not going to do that very often. What they're going to do most of the time is it's called a pigeonhole, which is just basically it's referred to the committee. And if you go look this up on a, com um, a congressional website, it'll say something, you know, defer to House Ways and Means Committee on April 10th, 2020. And you'll check back later. Let's say it's July 30th, 2021. 
you go check and it's still there. Um, it just got pigeonholed and never, nothing ever happened to it. They could send it off to a subcommittee where even more boredom happens. Um, they're tended to be more in-depth. They may actually, um, on the committee level as well, have public hearings. That Colbert video involves this. Um, and then it would go from subcommittee to committee, where then we got to go back to our same three options, which I could click back, or you can go back for yourself. Um, it is supposed to be formally read before the House or the Senate. There was actually a time you would read it. The current rule now is that once a bill comes out of committee, it cannot be discussed for 72 hours. It is intended that gives congressmen enough time to actually read every bill. Um, the likelihood that they do that is roughly the same likelihood that you're actually watching this video right now, honestly. Um, so that's the, that's the possibility they'll do that. And then after 72 hours, they'll debate the bill and possibly pass it. Um, there is debate, which um, honestly most of them have already made up their minds. Uh, my opinion is that the reason you go up for a House or Senate debate is so you can get some sound bites for when you run for re-election. Sometimes, though, a real debate actually does break out. Um, the term filibuster, um, it's, on the, it's not technically a thing anymore because the, the way the rules are done in the last seven, eight years or so now is that they set up a time where um, we say Friday at noon we're voting. Well, whoever holds the floor at Friday at noon has to surrender the floor. So it's theoretically impossible to filibuster now. Um, the last uh, great one was Ted Cruz filibustering Obamacare. Rand Paul actually went for 10, 11 hours over a, um, a nominee for the, um, I believe it was the CIA. Um, voting. I will tell you here there was an issue with the uh, coronavirus bill that several congressmen had gone home. Some were actually in self-quarantine. Um, Ted Cruz, for instance, he was in uh, self-quarantine because he had come in contact with someone who had coronavirus. Um, so there was actually an agreement that what they were going to do to pass the, uh, the Coronavirus Care Act, if you go look that up, was to have a voice vote, um, in which case just those who were still in Washington would come in, say aye, and leave. And no one would question it. There was actually one congressman from Kentucky who made an issue who saying that he was going to call for a roll call vote. And that would actually cause a major issue um, at that time. Um, so if it's something that I'm expecting everybody's going to pass, I expect that pretty much everybody's going to want to pass a coronavirus release bill. I mean, does anybody want to go run for re-election and say that you know, I didn't vote for relief here? Then they're probably going to call for a voice vote. Uh, standing or roll call, they also can do roll call with clickers. Um, and that would be a way, that, like if we're expecting it to be a pretty close division and we want to have a very certain name as to how they voted, then we do that. Um, there is no procedure for voting remotely. That's actually become, and most states don't have a procedure for this either. This is actually an issue in North Carolina as I record this. They're not going in session till April 28th, and they can't hold a session and actually adhere to their own, um, or to the government's own um, social distancing guidelines. There are no procedures, to my knowledge, in any state actually, for a legislative body on that state to vote remotely and to meet remotely. Uh, you cannot vote remotely in the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House either. You have to actually present yourself on the Senate or House floor and vote. Um, excuse me. Um, and if uh, in that event, we were talking about joint committees earlier, I said I'd come back to that. Um, basically, the only type of joint committee is a conference committee, where if the House and Senate pass two different versions of a bill, uh, they would then... Um, they would then... Pass it, uh, pass it off to a joint committee, and they would work out a revised version. Um, if they do all of that, they send it to the president. Now, the president has four options outlined in the Constitution. Um, if he signs it, then that's pretty easy. It goes into law. If he vetoes it, that's also pretty easy. It does not go into law unless Congress overrides it. More on that in a second. He, um, what does become an issue is if the president does not sign the bill... That pocket veto or not signed a bill at the bottom um, notes what happens. The, the theory is, I mean, he lives a mile away from the U.S. Capitol. If they send him a bill, he has 10 days, not including Sundays, by the way, to read the bill and either sign it or reject it. If after 10 days, he is still in, or Congress is still in session, 
and they have not gone home to their respective states, then he reasonably could have written a letter to them. The veto, he is supposed to send it back to Congress with his objections. He, um, the way he normally does this is write a letter. Um, he, he would send that to Congress, and reasonably, if they were there and he could object to the bill, then he should do so. So if 10 days passes and he has done nothing with a bill, it becomes a law without his signature. Um, if they are not in session, he could not reasonably address them concerning uh, what he didn't like about a bill. So it does not become a law. Uh, and that is known as a pocket veto. That shows up in standards, actually. Um, if he has vetoed it, and remember this is a veto, not a pocket veto. If he vetoes a law, it is, uh, goes to Congress. And this is very rare. Um, that they would override. If you actually go look up, Wikipedia has a list. There's been like 2,500 presidential vetoes in history. Of those, only a few hundred have ever been overridden. Um, I want to say George Bush was overridden like twice. Obama was overridden like one or two times. Uh, it does not happen very often. And that's it. Thank you for watching the video. Hopefully you enjoyed. Hopefully this helped you gain a better understanding of Congress.